Hello and welcome to the first virtual roundtable. My name is Mishnoni Smith and I'm the chief of the analysis division at FTA and I'd like to welcome you to our 2020 virtual TAM roundtable. Before we begin, I'd like to review some logistics to ensure you get the most out of this event. First of all, many of our presenters are speaking in a non-traditional environment, so you may hear a little extra background noise. Please bear with us and we will try to minimize as much as possible. As a participant, you are in listen only mode. This means there's no option for you to use your webcam or microphone throughout the event. However, when you have questions for FTA or the transit agency exec executives, please put them in the question and answer pod throughout the presentations. You can find this question and answer pod on the right side of your screen. There's an icon with two post-it notes and a question mark. Presenters will answer them during the designated question and answer section of this event. Due to the number of attendees at today's event, we may not be able to get to everyone's question. <clears throat> so you may not see your question um, go to the panel on the right side after sending it, but we have received it. And if there is time, we will get to it. If we are unable to get to it during this event, we will respond afterward. I want to also bring your attention that there is closed captioning for this event today. Uh, it can be turned on by selecting the icon along the, uh, it looks like a gear and at the bottom of your screen and you can select closed captioning. This event is being recording, is being recorded and a recording will be available on FTA's Transit Asset Management website in the next week or so. If you experience any technical difficulties during the event, please contact the TAM Roundtable email at capital T-A-M capital R roundtable at dot.gov. This inbox will actively be monitored throughout today's event. I'd also like to bring your attention, there's been a slight change to the agenda. Our uh, CFO of FTA's Office of Budget and Policy has been called away to an emergency budget meeting. In his place, we will have uh, the director of the Office of Strategic Planning and Analysis, John Georges, provide us a welcome. And with that, I will turn it over to John. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Knight, for that introduction. And again, um, Bob DeSillo asked me to um, send his regrets to everyone. Um, since for as long as I've worked with him, state of good repair has always been a priority for him. And he has always been a strong supporter of our asset management roundtables. And I know that he really wishes um, that he could be here. Uh, right now, um, obviously, the transit industry is dealing with unprecedented times, and FTA has been doing everything that we can to support all of you through this crisis. We are particularly proud of the fact that we've quickly allocated $25 billion in CARES Act funding to support capital and operating expenses to respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And in fact, through today, FTA has already awarded 571 uh, separate grants, totaling $21 billion of the available money for CARES Act grant awards. We also played an important role in coordinating with our partners at the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, and the rest of the administration in distributing more than 14.2 million cloth face coverings to transit, uh, transit agencies around the country to help protect both workers and riders. More than 2,200 transit systems uh, were able to receive cloth face coverings through this distribution. And we're encouraged to see everyone masking up to help keep transit operators and their fellow passengers safe. We've also <clears throat> um, used our authority under the uh, emergency relief program to take steps to help smooth the path for transit systems through these times. We've eliminated local match requirements and granted numerous extensions to, um, to regulatory deadlines, reporting requirements, and oversight reviews so that the transit industry can focus on the most important job, which is making sure that critical employees can get to the places they need to go during these times. This month does also mark a milestone as history does not stop. 
Our federal transit program was created a little more than 56 years ago on July 9th, 1964 with passage of the Urban Mass Transportation Act. Then on July 1st of 1968, the fledgling Urban Mass Transportation Agency got its first boots on the ground as staff at the Department of Housing and Urban Development moved to a new office over at the Department of Transportation. In those early days, the Urban Mass Transportation Agency was just 38 employees and they brought 23 typewriters with them and three adding machines to establish the new agency, which was renamed as the Federal Transit Administration in 1991. As you can see, we've come a long way since those early days. <clears throat> From the beginning though, is <clears throat> a key goal of our agency has been to support um, bringing the transit industry into a state of good repair and supporting better management of our assets. And we've come a long way since the passage of the asset management rule, which has now been being fully implemented. A lot has changed since the last time we did one of these round, um, round tables last year. And perhaps one silver lining to this pandemic is that this virtual event will be our largest round table event ever with over 500, with over 500 registrants. We're going to hear from a lot of agencies that have had a wide range of experiences during this pandemic who have also found their own silver linings in what is going on. In some cases, the reduction in service is, um, due to the lost ridership has created additional opportunities to address deferred maintenance and state of good repair activities have been accelerated to take advantage of, this, of the decline in transit ridership during these times. We are looking forward to riders returning to our transit system our best estimate is that right now, the transit industry has returned to serving 12 million trips per weekday. That's still about 63% lower than normal pre-pandemic times, but, on, <clears throat> but positively, it is more than triple the amount of average weekday trips that were being taken by transit riders at the low point in April when the coronavirus pandemic was at its peak. Today, you're going to hear from a panel that will address the fact that uh, an agency's TAM culture is paramount in moving forward on state of good repair. And that TAM culture can provide guidance during times of uncertainty and allow agencies to be flexible to reprioritize TAM needs and adjust their plans strategically and thinking about the needs of each asset. I want to thank you all for taking uh, time from your own efforts to respond to this pandemic, to take, <clears throat> to take a few hours this afternoon to think about your asset management practices and your asset management culture. We know that eventually this pandemic will pass and the transit industry will again res be responding to the mobility needs of our communities and we will need strong asset management culture to guide us through those times. I'll now turn it back over to Ms. Shadoni Smith. We'll introduce our panelists for today. Thank you, John. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Michidoni Smith and I am the chief of the analysis division. Many of you may be familiar with me from my previous post as the transit asset management program manager. So this topic and this event is very close to my heart. Today I will be moderating our discussion with the five transit agency executives from across the country that will discuss the impacts of this national public health emergency has had on their agencies and their assets. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Jessica Metford Miller from St. Louis Metro, Doug Holcomb from Greater Bridgeport Transit, Jenny Rowlin from Big Woods Transit, Carolyn Gano from Utah Transit Authority, and Jeff Tumlin from San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. Each panelist was, will give us a short introduction to their system and to recent experiences related to the COVID-19 emergency and relationship to asset management. And then we'll move on to a moderated discussion. Uh, and please remember to type any questions you have in the question and answer pod, and we will get to as many as we can. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Jessica Mefford Miller, is the Executive Director of Metro Transit, the St. Louis Metropolitan Region's Public Transportation System, where she is responsible for the operation of the 46 mile Metrolink light rail system, 400 bus Metro bus system, and 120 van Metro call a ride paratransit system that together carry more than 30 million passengers each year. 
Jessica joined the Metro Transit team in 2006. Previously, she held posts at the National Park Service, the Ohio Department of Transportation, and the Ohio State University. When she's not working with her team to serve the St. Louis region, you can find her having outdoor adventures with her family. Jessica, welcome. Thank you, Mrs. Doni, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk with you a little bit about Metro's Transit Asset Management Program. As you may be aware, we've got a very strong vehicle maintenance program in St. Louis. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of that but I also wanna share with you some of our more recent experiences over the last five months and the role that our TAM team and our, our TAM culture have played in our coronavirus response. Next slide, please. So the Metro Transit system, just to give you an overview, we span two states, Missouri and Illinois. We cover about 550 square miles. We have a Metro bus fixed route system of 84 routes. We also have a partnership with Lyft to provide first and last mile connections, and we operate microtransit in two of our markets with VIA. Our Metrolink system spans 46 miles and 38 stations. We have 86 light rail vehicles, and our Coloride paratransit system includes 120 vans. Together, Metrobus, Metrolink, and Coloride are carrying about 38 million passenger boardings each year across a 550 square mile service area. Next slide. So when we began focusing on coronavirus, like many of us did back in February, we quickly began to organize our team and our resources so that we could respond efficiently and effectively. And our emergency management and TAM teams both played an integral role alongside operations and other administration, administrative teams. The role of TAMS has been really critical for us and in the context of our overall incident command structure, the TAM team pivoted and paused some of our ongoing operations initially to stand up a very detailed category of all of our assets. From late February through today, every single day, they're pushing out a detailed capability matrix and decision makers like me as our incident commander are using that to make sure we've got a handle on our supply chain for things like PPE, uh, fuel, commodities like tires, which initially were a challenge when our supply chain was disrupted. And most importantly, this team is tracking our most precious resource, which is our people. How many operators, mechanics and support personnel we have each day to support our ongoing efforts. And this has guided us in making decisions about things like service level. Together, we are participating in regularly scheduled briefings initially for a period of months. Those were daily briefings. We've backed that down now uh, to a threat level four and we're doing weekly briefings, but with regular correspondence and collaboration between that. Next slide. Like many transit systems, our response has included mask requirements for all of our operators and all, and all of our customers. Our maintenance team quickly stepped in and came up with some innovative solutions. We manufactured and designed polycarbonate shields for our operators for a little over 300 buses that don't come equipped from the manufacturer with operator shields. And those have allowed us to reduce some of the risk for our customers as well as those frontline team members. We've reduced capacity and service level across our system, and we've also installed additional equipment and tools like hand washing stations and hand sanitizer. We've closed some of our operating facilities to customer traffic like our indoor transit centers. Much of this has been supported by our vehicle and facility maintenance teams and that TAM group. I credit this really systematic and coordinated response with our ability to ramp up quickly. And by mid-March, we had many of the procedures and mitigation strategies that you see here in place. We're continuing to rely on that team today. We've got a solid battle rhythm established though, and we're focusing more now on implementation of our TAM program. Next slide, please. So here at Metro Transit, our TAM program really began in earnest about 20 years ago. We began using new technology and new software that was ultimately led to our reliability-centered maintenance program. 
The results of that program have been incredibly impactful. Early on, we began improving our vehicle reliability, improving our service on time performance, reducing our accident rates, reducing our maintenance cost per mile, and in total, we reduced our customer complaints. Our vehicles for several years now have been pushed well beyond their useful life. So we manage the life cycle of our assets, not just in anticipated useful life, but in maintenance costs, including life to date maintenance costs, mileage for our vehicles, performance of assets, age and our safety system performance. This performance management process has contributed to how we manage and measure our asset ratings here at Metro. We completed our TAM plan in 2018, and we've recently completed our first round of asset inventories for our linear assets, our vehicles, facilities, and all of our components. Next slide, please. Now we're working alongside our safety team and applying our TAM principles and TAM strategy to our safety management systems. We are together as an organization focused on maintaining all of our assets in a state of good repair. We've done this for a number of years for vehicles, but more recently we've expanded this approach to include our facilities, operating facilities, and customer facilities, as well as our linear, as our linear assets. Next slide. So now we are at a point with TAM where we're really on the home stretch toward internal adoption. And this is not without uh, its challenges, certainly. Some of the things we've been doing in the last year include integrating disparate departments that otherwise didn't have a direct connection to vehicle or facility maintenance. That includes teams like finance and program development and grants and engineering. And by the way, here at Metro, our TAM team rests within our vehicle maintenance division. So we're working together. We are learning to new technologies. We're implementing a new software. We're using Trapeze Enterprise Asset Management, by the way. And we're working together to coordinate our TAM plan with our overall capital plan. And in our current uh, three-year capital budget that was just passed a few months ago, our TAM plan and our capital projects, including maintenance programs that come from our operating budget and our future state of good repair and uh, new construction capital programs are closely related to our TAM, TAM plan. We've been able to do this because we've established a unified vision for a TAM program, and that's communicated from the CEO all the way down to the front line. We're using the same tools, and that has been a challenge to get everyone to let go of the spreadsheets and some of our old strategies and really embrace new shared softwares. And now we're working through training. This has been a roadblock for us during the coronavirus experience because we're not able to come together. So we're going to be relying in the months ahead on some computer-based training and uh, coordination sessions like this via Zoom and other technologies so that we can conti continue our coordination. So we're on the right track with TAM. We've got a strong team and a strong program, and I look forward to the outcome of our current capital plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, next, we have Doug Holcomb, who is the general manager and CEO of Greater Bridgeport Transit in Connecticut. Previously, Doug served as the Director of Planning and Service Development for 11 years at Bridgeport. He has held a number of positions in public transportation and regional planning over the past 30 years, including Director of pra excuse me, Paratransit Services at the Greater Hartford Transit District and Assistant Director of the Central Nog Nogtuck Valley Council of Governments, forgive me for, for missaying that word. Doug has served as a member of the Connecticut Public Transportation Commission and as a chairman of the Connecticut Association for Community Transportation. He is also a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and the American Planning Association. He holds a master's degree in community planning and development from the University of Rhode Island. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. Um, what you'll see in the upcoming slides uh, is similar to what Jessica mentioned, a much smaller scale, but a lot of the same problems and a lot of the same uh, type of use uh, of the Transit Asset Management Program here at Bridgeport, um, as, as you saw in, in St. Louis. Uh, next slide, please. 
So here's where I normally would be showing you that we have 57 buses and uh, we do about 5.2 million boardings on the fixed route every year, but I thought I would share this with you because the very first epicenter of the COVID-19 in the United States that was declared was very close to where we are and we were hit very hard by this. So I wanted to give you a sense of the location of Bridgeport on the southwestern coast of Connecticut uh, and very close to the New York area and, um, and Westchester County. Next slide, please. This is a compressed version of the timeline of our activities associated with our response. It was prepared from a much larger presentation that we put together for Congressman Himes here in the 4th District. And along the bottom are some of the international events and some local events. Uh, on the blue boxes, and I'll walk through some of these things and, and what we've done, are, are, are some of the key elements of our response. And the blue bubbles on the top are our ridership. So in um, early January, uh, we were watching the World Health Organization reports on what was happening with the virus. We made our first order of PPE in January, uh, long before um, our finance department thought we should do that, and also before it was recommended, but we did order masks for our staff. And, and then we started looking into our contagious disease protocol. Now, mind you, we don't have a very sophisticated um, a document associated with contagious disease protocol, but we did have some experience from a couple of years ago when there was a measles scare, and then a couple of years before that when there's Ebola. And we made heavy use of TCRP 769, which is um, a transit planning for a pandemic. So we started looking at all that, and then we began identifying uh, disinfection contractors. We were watching what was happening in the Pacific Northwest. We were looking at what other transit agencies in Washington State, for example, were doing um, and looking at that response and also seeing on basically on the news that there were these fogging systems and disinfecting systems. So we identified some of those. And th in the next box, we, we I just wanted to mention, we started a lot of public outreach, uh, internal, internal and external outreach. We started the bus disinfecting program in the middle of March, early on in the program, and we were issuing PPE to staff who wanted it. And at that time, it wasn't recommended, but we made it available uh, to, to both the maintenance and operating staff. And some of the key things that we had to do, and I think this is common in many transit agencies across the country, was we uh, closed the bus station, we suspended the collection of fares, and it's still suspended today, and we had rear door entry. So this virus early in March and late, this was sweeping through the area, and we were having a wonderful, wonderful year in terms of ridership. We were looking at 17, 18,000 boardings a day, and just basically overnight, all of that, all of that tanked. And the rest of the um, the rest of the uh, boxes show some of the items that we that we did and that that we continue to do. We now have developed uh, PPE kits to keep the staff safe. Uh, we're doing mask outreach to get the riders to wear masks. In Connecticut, we can't insist on that, but we are heavily encouraging people. And going into this, we already had about 70% of the fixed route fleet equipped with the driver barriers uh, for protection against assault. Those became much more critical in this environment. And so uh, by the end of July, 100% of the paratransit and the fixed route fleet will be equipped with shields um, of various kinds to protect the driver. So um, we, you know, so ridership was real strong and then dipped uh, very quickly on us. And we spent a lot of time in and almost everything we've done in the last five or six months has been a response to that. And it's starting to pick up um, in, we're starting to see this is same as the numbers uh, that John mentioned earlier on, we're seeing some anywhere between 50 and 60% of the ridership returning. And that is bringing its own issues and, and things like frequency of service are becoming new, uh, new consideration to, to reduce crowding are becoming new considerations in the planning division. Um, so uh, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> we were, in terms of the development of the transit asset management plan, a much, much smaller agency than what you just heard about, but in the fabled catbird seat, really. We had great partners uh, at the Department of Transportation who took the lead in the development of a tier two plan for all of the smaller providers. So even uh, immediately following the, the notice of proposed rulemaking, CONDOT was developing um, a gap analysis in the transit asset management. So ultimately, we uh, we were part of that plan. We worked with them on the development of targets. We we worked with them on, the, um, on coordinating with the MPO uh, and adopted the plan um, in time for the deadline. I've been working with them since then. And one of the great things that has come out of that um, 
is the ability of the of the facility assessments that have been required to inform the capital program. All right, so Jessica mentioned some of that, and that is true for us as well. So uh, we had done our own facility assessment, and it turned out to be some 1,200 pages of uh, I, of projects in the in the asset management um, assessment, the facility assessment uh, that we used to inform the capital program. And then the department just this May completed the um, building inspection report for the the um, the terminal in downtown Bridgeport, which is great. And immediately within a week was used to help inform the current capital plan that's in development. And one thing I want to say about this, and I, I don't know um, where else this might be, but we feel very fortunate here, um, the way that the capital program is managed in the state. And I can tell you, while there's been, uh, I think this is true also across the country, not uh, a great increase in investment in operating. We turned our attention to the capital program around the time that um, we were starting to talk about more formal transit asset management and since then have done a lot of state of good repair projects, including the replacement of the maintenance roof, the replacement of all the lifts, replacement of underground storage tanks, perimeter fencing, uh, bus wash, chassis steam room, all of the real uh, basic elements of the facility. We're able to build the electric infrastructure for electric buses and uh, and and the average uh, age of our fleet uh, hovers at around six years. So uh, both of these facilities would fall at, at least at three, uh, probably above three or four, uh, four and a half in the term scale. And I think we, we were in good shape going through it um, coming into this and I and um, and there's been some problems with our projects and that's what the next slide is about but you know nothing nothing really catastrophic so you can turn to the next slide please uh, just a couple examples so the the idea of, in our case that uh, ridership dropped and therefore there's this time available for us to do um, a backlog of state of good repair it hasn't really materialized because and um, in our service, we kept the service on the street because we didn't want crowding. So going into this, we had a really efficient service, averaging 30 trips per bus per hour, fare box recovery ratio hovering at 30%. So when ridership uh, tanked, we still needed to keep the buses on the road. We made some modifications based on declining ridership, but mostly put those buses into a larger extra board, a pool of buses that could be assigned for crowding and other routes. But just two projects on the right is um, some state of good repair projects at our bus terminal in downtown Bridgeport, uh, pavement project, remilling, some full depth reconstruction, things like that. Um, that is proceeding as it was originally planned. And on the left, you see our first zero emission bus. That's a Proterra um, bus. And many of you probably recognize that. And it was built during uh, the pandemic. However, getting the inspections and getting um, all of the required certifications and now the training have proven to be very difficult for us. And we, like Jessica mentioned, we'll have to work on some remote training uh, and it will take longer to put these buses into service than we originally envisioned, mostly because of those um, kind of the last things uh, to, to take place before deployment, including heavy training of the maintenance and operating staff. So ridership drop, but the service stayed generally the same. Some projects uh, had some delays and others, particularly the projects that are outdoor uh, shelter improvement programs and hubs and things like that. Those have continued for us. Next slide, please. I think this is almost identical to one of the slides that uh, Jessica showed you. And um, I just highlighted a few things, and these are probably the biggest impact for um, helping our operators to stay at ease and, and helping our customers to continue to use the service. And that's the suspension of fare collection, rear door entry. We're doing a lot of disinfecting now. Um, we did a lot of service modifications and we were able to work with the union, have a very flexible, uh, we were doing almost daily bids to, um, and the operators were very um, comfortable with that. We had regular communication with the union and we installed driver shields. Uh, they, I think they're very appreciative of that. And in Connecticut, I'm guessing that the installation of driver shields and the cleaning program uh, um, with, uh, with uh, some proven efficacy is, is going to be the key to starting to enter through the front doors and, uh, and collecting fares again, which is going to be critical to us. I don't know if you all had this too, but we all, we, one of the great things that the state did was made bus drivers frontline workers in terms of getting rapid testing. So if someone thought they were exposed or if somebody had some other reason, uh, we could send them just right up to, North, to New Haven and they would know the testing, uh, the results of the test before they left. And they could then either quarantine or they could come back to work. And so the so it's 
the uh, driver shields and the other part I, I wanted to mention was what's next for our cleaning program, and that is the next slide. We've, um, I'm sorry, just briefly, we did a ton of community engagement, and uh, this has been important in ensuring information both internally and externally. So I, I won't hover on this. I'm sure everybody's done a lot of community engagement. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so like everybody, when uh, mid-February came and and early March and we were looking at our cleaning programs and we had a hardy cleaning program and very few complaints. Um, we have about eight complaints per 100,000 boardings here. That hasn't changed during the event and uh, and maybe one or two a month uh, complaints about cleanliness of the bus. But what we wanted to do in our next phase is do a gap assessment by um, scientists. So we have contracted with an environmental health and service firm uh, to do in the, in the next week or two, uh, an assessment of all of the elements of our cleaning program uh, to help us identify where we could do better and where we're putting resources and what are some of the best materials and best practices. So we're looking forward to that and the goals of all of that I won't go through, but uh, they're similar to what I'm guessing all of you are going through, making sure that the drivers are cust uh, drivers and the customers are comfortable with the cleaning program that's going on. Um, next slide, please. I think that's it. So uh, that's everything that we've done, and uh, you know, I'll I'll be happy to answer any questions when the time comes. All right, thank you, Doug. We're going to move on to our next presenter, um, which is Miss Jenny Rowland. Um, she is the transportation manager at Big Woods Transit. Jenny is a registered tribal member of the Rocky Bay First Nations in Ontario, Canada, and a descendant of the Boy. Fort Band of Chippewa in northern Minnesota. She belongs to the Golden Eagle Clan is and is a jingle dress dancer. Jenny has spent 30 years with dispatching and logistics, moving people and equipment in a timely manner, first as a 911 operator and then as a communication center manager for Wildland Fire. Jenny has found it very exciting to her, extend her skills into public transit and being on the ground floor of the program development. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Boys Fort uh, Public Transportation is a program uh, for the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. We're located in northern Minnesota. We have a couple um, kind of subsidiaries. Uh, I think it's important that I put it into focus. We're a very small program. Uh, compared to my uh, counterparts here. Uh, we have 10, 10 buses, uh, minus two in this picture because we um, always, there's always seems to be two out of the barn no matter what, uh, but there isn't a barn. So all the buses are outside all the time. It's cold enough where we are that we have to leave our buses running all night, sometimes in the winter. Uh, it's that cold. So, uh, we do um, public transit, uh, demand response. Uh, we have several routes that are um, commuter routes for workers, but mostly demand response for shopping. There's a little information about the Boy Sport Reservation. They're one of the few, uh, one of two tribes in the United States that has non-contiguous land sectors. So it's kind of a logistics challenge. Uh, Net Lake sector is where my office is located and uh, there's approximate sizes there. Vermilion sector is uh, another administrative area and then Deer Creek sector, which each of these sectors are over 60 miles away from each other. So the public transit, uh, Big Woods Transit uh, provides services for all the native communities on the reservation, but also all the non-native communities in between and throughout this in, uh, region in our service area. Next slide. So this is a little map just to kind of show you where, where we are. I mean, uh, transit is very similar um, as far as providing services to the public, but I think it's important uh, for other people, especially larger urban areas, to understand where we're located um, and how rural and isolated our location is. So our challenges may be a little bit different uh, because of our distances. It's 65 miles one way to the nearest grocery store. So we're living in a, in a food desert. We have a lot of transit dependent people 
uh, living throughout this region. Uh, next slide, please. And so just uh, this is what we've changed. Look at that mean looking COVID virus there. Ooh. So these are our changes that we've gone through. We've changed our routes. Um, there's been a lot of cancellation of routes, uh, a lot of deviation of routes, changing where we go, how we go to different places. Um, there's a lot of routes that we did for the nursing homes in the region, both in uh, Orr and Cook, that I'm not sure, or adult day centers that I'm not sure those routes are even going to be coming back as far as uh, providing services to the elders in the region. Um, we've done lots of changing medication for the virus, wiping everything down, fogging, um, I haven't installed any shields as yet, but there is a no mask, no ride uh, policy. Gotten some new fogging in equipment in. We've done lots of staff education, which was really difficult um, with really the lack of information. Now, we didn't really understand this virus initially back in April and uh, March. So there's lots of education for staffing, for our public. Um, just letting people know uh, what it's about, how we're going to be handling it, how we're going to be keeping them safe. Uh, staff education, did lots of training on equipment, uh, PPE. Uh, the data reporting is changed. I mean, we're not going to be having as many rides. The ridership has fallen. The mileage has fallen. As far as dispatching goes, um, you know, we try to practice um, no mask, no ride, but also uh, if social distancing on the bus, so the dispatching uh, really watches that when the number of people call in, how many people are going to be on that bus, which bus are we going to send, and whether we need to send two buses to maintain that social distancing. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jenny. Um, it is so nice to have tribal representation on the panel today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next, I'm going to introduce Carolyn Gano, she is the executive director at the Utah Transit Authority, delivering bus, light rail, commuter rail, and paratransit services to Salt Lake City and the Wasatch region. Prior to joining UTA, Carolyn held various executive management roles at Santa Clara Valley Transit Authority with responsibilities that ranged from planning and policy to asset management to major capital project delivery. She was key in discussions with the board at Santa Clara and local stakeholders on options for the operations and maintenance funding for the BART to Silicon Valley extension, leading to the successful ballot measure for operating assistance. Carolyn worked for transportation consulting firms before joining Santa Clara, and her education includes a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the U University of Notre Dame and a master's degree in civil from Pennsylvania State University. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, I just want to go over a few things. I'm going to keep my presentation fairly short so we have time for some questions, but um, I just wanted to go through uh, just sort of who we are and just some of the things that we're doing. Um, we actually are, as mentioned, um, are a multimodal agency. We have a commuter rail system. Um, over 90 miles of commuter rail running north south from Ogden to Salt Lake City and then down into Provo. So we cover six counties in our service region. Uh, we also have over 40 miles of light rail in Salt Lake County. We have a streetcar system, um, run uh, buses out of four units, uh, demand response um, time that we, ha uh, we have run a demand response flex service as well, a van pool service, and we were in the middle of the new microtransit pilot project when the pandemic hit, and that was um, highly successful in the area that we were doing um, that pilot project. And now we're still seeing the numbers drop substantially, but we're still seeing um, that sort of start to move up again. Um, we have approximately 2,600 employees, and actually this year we were celebrating our 50th anniversary. We still are, but it's not at all what we expected and haven't been able to do many of the functions that we had planned to do, include hosting um, APTA's board, uh, transit board member conference in our area. 
So I'll just go to the next slide. Um, you know, we've had a number of efforts on COVID-19 um, that were, of course were focused primarily on the safety for passengers and employees. Um, it's interesting in our county, um, we do have um, a lot of communications to the public and the employees, but we are six counties and in our state, the state never shut down and each county it, it makes their decisions, but also work working collaboratively with the governor. So not all of our counties are at the same risk levels and not all the counties are shut have the same sort of um, shutdowns or reopenings as well. So we try to manage that among each other, among what we're doing. What we did do was create a, a UTA's recovery dashboard. Um, and that's our the website it is. But if you go to you rideuta.com on the front page, if you go down through some of the things that scroll across and you click on our recovery dashboard, what it does is it allows us instead of doing a report out Many agencies have put a report together to show what we're doing. We actually dynamically make changes to it all the time. So I want to go to the next slide because this was primarily came out of a that's the front page of the recovery task force. Uh, sorry, Terry recovery task force storyboard. We call it a storyboard, but it's on a website and it and, it, and you can just scroll down through it. And there's a bunch of headings at the top that cover, um, you know, recovery. Um, we do a recovery overview, ridership, safety, service planning, COVID-19 surveys. We did a number of surveys um, since the pandemic hit. Um, we also include all our financial updates. So what our revenues are coming in, where our fares are, and that's updated monthly. Um, our service run, run our service, the amount of service that we're putting out on the street, any changes, what our ridership is, that's all updated. They can get into our ridership portal. So everything is located there as well as all of our safety standards. Um, and many of our safety standards are similar to what you've heard the other three speakers talk about. So I'm not going to go over that. Very similar rear door boarding, putting up um, shields on the uh, on the buses where we didn't have shields, number of activities. In fact, right now we're putting in the shields and we have a little gauge. If you go through the storyboard that says what percent of our bus fleet has the store has the the operator shields in. So it's a way to be more dynamic and able to have people engage and see what we're doing. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So that's our ridership snapshot and that gets updated consistently all week. We carry a, over 40 million riders a year, roughly 160,000 riders a day. Right now we're carrying 54,000, a little over 54,000 right now. You can sort of see where um, we were at a high on the right. And these are by mode and so it might be a little bit hard to read um, and then but if you get on the storyboard, it's on there and actually it's probably extended past July 6 by now, but um, in updated, but we're carrying roughly now about we're down about 66% of our service. But what we were what we are seeing and we so let's put this. We did decrease our service 56%. What's interesting is, is that our fares have not gone down 66%. They've gone down about 50%. So it does tell us a little bit about the market and what we ha have seen is a lot of our commuters who use passes that are oftentimes purchased by their employers are not riding the service. So we're not seeing front runner or commuter rail service that serves a huge eight to five type of crowd um, that has not come back. Um, we're starting to see though our bus rider ridership come back and what is most interesting to us is that um, in the middle of this, we had the earthquake, um, which then actually had a big drop that day and then it slowly moved up. But it was, I think it was, um, we're starting to see the ridership tick up as we start, as the region starts to reopen. Salt Lake County is still under a moderate risk phase. There's a high, moderate, low, and then new norm green phase. Um, we are in the, moderate phase for Salt Lake County and the rest of our region is in the yellow phase, so which is a low risk phase. So there's different things are opened at that point. And what we're trying to do is consistently trying to work through what we do. Our safety measures are across the board, um, uh, assuming moderate risk for the whole region. We are adding service back August 23rd. We'll bring it up to about 90% of the service hours that we were operating. Um, what we're not bringing back fully is some of some weekend service on the rail and some mostly the express bus routes. Many of them are not coming back because we're just not seeing the big commute market. 
And I did want to say a little bit is that what we're what we are seeing is that our ridership um, currently is like I mentioned 54,000 with we are actually seeing our peak in the midday right now, which didn't used to happen. So our peak is around 11 a.m. What we're seeing is is that a week the workers that are taking it are heavily geared towards the essential workers. So the people who are taking the trips are really essential, essential workers, and they have continued to ride. I mean, I think the lowest we went was we were still carrying 32,000 a day. We're up around 54 now, but um, just to to understand that um, we've had about 54 percent. We did a survey of who, who we are working, who our riders are, and um, we're seeing many of them, about 54 percent have continued to ride during the COVID. Um, but maybe not as much as they used to ride. But what we, when we go and talk to the pass holder, sur we did a pass holder survey, we're seeing a huge amount of people, over 36% of them do not know when they will even return to work. Um, we're seeing another third uh, thinking they may start sometime after August 1st, and we don't know if that's gonna happen either. So that's where our market for those commute services and our commuter rail are, so we're continuing to watch that. I want to go next to the next slide. So some of the things we have done in terms of the TAM, we our asset management program is in the mass ma asset management um, department, but that also includes maintenance of way, our vehicle, um, our vehicle maintenance team, our vehicle procurement team as well. They're all in that same department along with our asset management plan and our facilities teams is in there as well. So our major projects that we have done some changes on is our vehicle procurements. We do have um, a set of uh, buses that we each year we plan on ordering. We are deferring a bus order right now and we're taking out. We're just going to um, take the first option out on the bus order that we plan on doing and not the additional option because some of those also are looking. They one of the bus orders is actually for commuters and just for it's like um, over the road coach that we use for express buses. We have those coming in. We're not sure where we'll be using those um, if we don't have our express buses up and running, but it is something that we're taking a look at. Um, we do look at everything else proceeding as planned. Um, we haven't had any other real impacts to our projects. Now, I will say that due to the CARES funding, which we're talking about on these minor projects, we've been able to use some of the CARES projects for safety improvements we wanted to you do on the revenue vehicles, not just the operator shields. We're changing out all of the material seats on the light rail, the cushions, and changing to sort of a vinyl hardback type of thing that's easier to maintain. Um, and then we're also looking at how to ramp up some of the efforts related to our facility rehabs, rehab, rehabilitation needs, and doing some basic improvements that we can do at this point. So in some cases, we've moved something, moved things up. I will say in the state of Utah, I think we're recovering. I'm not saying we're recovering, but we haven't our, our unemployment rate is about 5%. It's much higher um, in the sense of, let, I mean, high, higher in the terms of having a lower, uh, not a very low employment rate compared, unemployment rate compared to others. The other thing that we're seeing is, is that, um, that our sales tax revenues actually came in higher than the year before in April. And, and in May, May just slightly above the year before. So it has had an impact on our budget because we assumed a higher growth rate um, in May, but we're not seeing these big hits on our uh, sales tax and we're two thirds dependent on our sales tax rates. So it is interesting. So the CARES funding is really helping supplement the, the loss of the fair revenues that we're seeing at this point. And then we're able to do some of these other additional projects. So we're seeing the CARES funding carrying us through for about two years. Um, so we're a little bit um, luckier than a lot of the other big agencies. And I think you may be hearing from San Francisco soon and 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 they're not. I don't think they're in the same boat that Utah is as well. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I would say um, one of our keys to success is we do have a defined five year capital plan. There was some um, uh, the Utah Senate had passed a bill um, SB 136 that defined a lot of our authorities as UTA. And one of the things was providing a five year capital plan. 
which is what we do do, and it goes through our board as well as an advisory council. Um, that actually continues to take a look at what our asset, man asset management needs are, particularly in terms of state of good repair. That's really key for us. We tend to do a lot of debt financing. So we're seeing as COVID-19 hits is how do we continue? The biggest fear in the long term is, is that we don't get the riders back and we don't see the fare increase. Um, and then at the same time, the pushback on what the sales taxes should be. So those will be those are two two key things we have to worry about. The CARES funding gives us a cushion for now, but we are seeing in the outer years, the last three years, where we might start to hit a wall and really need to, um, particularly in terms of state of good repair. So those are the things that we're continuing to take a look at. So right now, it looks like that we can handle most of the activities within the, these two years of the pandemic, surprisingly, and that we're going to get hit hard in the following three years, potentially, um, if we can't have some savings. So we continue to focus on operating savings, and we are seeing those as well um, to date. So I think the biggest issue for us right now is to providing some flexibility to be able to reallocate any of the funding that we need that may, be, that may um, impact our projects going forward that we see in the out, in the outer years. We have a fairly um, uh, robust um, TAM plan and program, so we need to continue to stay on top of that. Um, we have a very highly um, capital intensive program, particularly with the two rail systems um, and um, over 600 buses and, and includes our ski buses. We have a ski bus season, so we have a number of ski buses as well. So we continue to look at um, what we will move forward with in the future, hoping to continue to move what we have the first two years. We've been, we were lucky there. We had, we had, we have a lot of debt. We restructured our debt, had $77 million in savings um, and some savings on some other restructuring. And some of that will be a one time. We are um, planning on doing a one time influx into the state of good repair program. So uh, we're, uh, the capital program seems to be going, the offering side we continue to look at, but our operating is so tied to our rehab needs in the future. And if we need more money in operating, it cuts on our um, state of good repair. So I think that's, that's, is that my last slide? Yes. So that's all I have. Oh, thank uh, you so much, Carolyn. Carolyn. And, and last but not least, we have Jeffrey, Jeffrey Tomlin. He is the executive, oh, excuse me. He is the director of transportation at the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. He oversees the Municipal Railway, Muni, parking, traffic engineering, bicycle and pedestrian safety, transportation accessibility, and taxi regulation for the city and county of San Francisco. Prior to this role, Jeff was the Director of Strategy at Nelson Nygaard Consulting Associates, a San Francisco-based transportation planning and engineering firm that focuses on sustainable mobility. Previously, he served as interim director of the New Oakland Department of Transportation. For more than 20 years, Jeff has, has led station area, downtown citywide and campus plans and delivered various lectures and classes in 20 US states and five countries. In 2012, he published his book titled Sustainable Transportation Tools for Creating Healthy, Vibrant and Resilient Communities. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and the next one. So the SFMTA is unusual among transit agencies in that we are also the city department of transportation. We oversee all ground transportation in San Francisco uh, and our transit system is rather complex. Uh, in addition to running uh, buses and light rail, uh, as many of you know, we also run cable cars and historic streetcars, uh, along with uh, managing an extensive electric trolley network and overseeing bikes and taxis and walking and scooters and bike share and a whole variety of other programs. Uh, our system is uh, complex, which makes it in some ways resilient and in some ways uh, very vulnerable to change. Uh, we also serve uh, about 750,000 uh, average weekday boardings, at least in the before time uh, back in January. Next slide, please. 
Um, we have, uh, uh, because of the diversity of our system, uh, we've got a lot of assets, uh, about $15 billion in replacement in total, uh, with about a $3 billion asset replacement um, backlog. Um, San Francisco is very much a boom bust economy. Uh, and as a result, we tend to go through cycles of uh, adding additional deferred maintenance and then cleaning up that mess uh, in order to smooth out the vagaries of our budget. Um, we were just starting to close the gap that we created for ourselves back from the 2008 recession. Uh, we were just starting to close that at the peak of a boom economy uh, back at the end of last year. Uh, and we're now prepared to uh, be greatly worsening our asset management backlog um, as we deal with the economic devastation uh, associated with COVID. Some of our asset uh, management deferral, though, is actually related to our strategy, uh, particularly around some of our parking structures, uh, which we are intentionally not maintaining because they no longer make economic sense. Um, several of our parking garages we will likely be demolishing and turning into uh, development sites uh, because uh, we're seeing a sharp demand in parking or a sharp, a sharp decline in parking demand in San Francisco, uh, largely associated with Uber or Lyft, but also mode shift to walking, biking and transit. Next slide, please. Uh, The uh, so obviously COVID has had a very large impact on everything that we do. Uh, we're very fortunate in San Francisco um, that the county health directors in the Bay Area were the first to act and the mayor of San Francisco was the first to uh, enact very strict shutdown uh, shelter in place rules uh, and that has um, not only saved thousands of lives here in the Bay Area, um, but also um, helped to save our transit system. Uh, we took a very strong stance to protect the health and safety of our operators um, and to make the system more resilient. So early in shelter in place back in March, we immediately shut down um, all of our cable car and historic streetcar services because these vehicles were the only vehicles that we had that did not uh, have protective barriers for the operators. Then back in Early April, we made a very painful decision to shut down our entire subway and light rail network, largely to retreat to a place of radical resiliency. Um, we were starting to see significant absences among our workforce, and our rail system is dependent upon a whole chain of technical expertise, where if we had just a couple of people uh, out in quarantine uh, who maintained critical parts of the rail system, uh, we would not be able to operate that system. So we decided again to retreat to a place of radical resiliency and go all bus starting at the second week of April. Uh, we also made the decision in order to address the fact that about 40% of our workforce was not able to show up for work rather than to do an across the board set of service cuts. We eliminated three quarters of our muni lines. Uh, in order to direct all of our available service to our highest ridership lines, the lines that our essential workers were most dependent upon, the lines that served essential, ser uh, essential institutions like the hospitals, and, and especially the lines that served neighborhoods where our residents had the fewest mobility choices, uh, the fewest choices either to get to work or the fewest choices to get to essential services. Uh, so our effort at completely redoing our entire transit system in one weekend was very much focused uh, on equity uh, and some uh, national um, uh, academic uh, analysis uh, that was independent confirmed that our rearrangement of the service um, was the most equity forward in North America. Um, obviously, we've done all the other things that the other operators have talked about including uh, increased, increased uh, vehicle cleaning. Uh, we restructured our entire uh, uh, schedule so that every uh, operator returns their bus to the yard where the bus can be cleaned before going out again. So uh, many of our vehicles were being cleaned uh, and fully cleaned and sterilized three times a day. Um, we've also uh, made an enormous uh, investment in helping to shift uh, people to other modes of transportation in order to offload the need for muni. 
Uh, we have uh, about, I don't know, over 40 miles of slow streets and protected bikeways that we have implemented in the last uh, two months uh, in order to uh, make it safer for people to walk and bike. Um, we have also legislated 74 miles of new transit only lanes uh, in order to make sure that as traffic congestion comes back that our buses are not stuck in congestion, particularly given the fact that we saw between a 30 and 50% improvement in travel time uh, during the COVID period as a result of that loss of congestion. Next slide, please. Um, so during the COVID shutdown, we worked really hard in order to try to catch up on some of the deferred maintenance, particularly in the subway, uh, while the trains were not running. Uh, we ran into problems, however, uh, given the nature of the work in the subway, uh, being very hard uh, to allow our crews to do the necessary work while maintaining social distance. So we worked collaboratively with the public health department in order to invent entirely new standard operating procedures for our maintenance crews so that they could catch up in some of that maintenance work while also uh, maintaining safety. Uh, we've been fortunate that although we've had a total of 35 COVID positive cases at the SFMTA um, since the beginning, uh, our COVID positive rate is about 10% lower than the general population. Uh, and all of our COVID positive workers um, have recovered. And most importantly, we have not had evidence of a single workplace transmission of COVID. Uh, we're very proud of the efforts that we have put into place uh, to protect our workforce while still allowing them to do their essential work. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that we're doing as well, uh, as we're basically completely reinventing everything that we do at the SFMTA, is we're having to reinvent our rail system. Uh, we are bringing back rail service on August 22nd. Uh, our rail system uh, is very complex, and back in January, it was notoriously unreliable. Uh, our train platforms were built for four car trains, and we were operating one car trains in our subway having five surface lines convene uh, in two portals uh, uh, resulted in very poor reliability. Uh, and in addition, we had uh, terrible congestion at our Embarcadero turnaround. Um, so we're dramatically simplifying the system in order to improve reliability. Uh, and we will be running only two and three car trains in the subway in order to dramatically expand capacity these improvements are absolutely necessary in order to allow us to continue to support social distancing uh, on our trains as we bring service back. Um, I should add um, that we are keeping track uh, on a daily basis of standing loads in our trains and our buses and rearranging all of our service to focus on maintaining social distance, uh, particularly for our essential workers. Uh, knowing that travel patterns have changed dramatically during this time period. Um, and so all of these changes uh, are uh, uh, necessary to accommodate COVID. We also think that uh, these may be things that we want to maintain long term uh, if they are successful, as we hope, in expanding reliability and improving capacity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, we're uh, obviously doing a lot of work planning for the future. Uh, our service is dependent, uh, our fare box revenue is about 20% of our total revenue. Uh, we also get substantial funding from parking fees and fines, also the San Francisco General Fund. Um, all of our immediate revenue sources are down 70 to 95%, and we're expecting significant losses in the citywide general fund. Uh, we're expecting these losses will continue for a long time, uh, and it will likely, if we look at previous uh, recessions, we're expecting it will take at least 15 years for us to recover. Uh, the CARES funds uh, allow us to continue to maintain service uh, through the end of this calendar year. Uh, we will then start burning uh, our fund reserve and other one-time sources to get us through 2021. Uh, we fall off a financial cliff in 2022 and literally a financial cliff. Uh, we will be able to avoid uh, layoffs for quite some time, uh, but uh, we're avoiding layoffs largely because of our failure in our human resources department a year ago uh, that resulted in over 600 vacancies uh, in our department. 
Um, and so the combination of our pre-existing vacancies plus attrition uh, is really what's going to get SFMTA through this period without massive layoffs, um, along with the fact that we have a substantial reserve um, that we are uh, uh, gutting. Um, so things are really bad. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that uh, it will take us more than a decade to recover. Uh, when we restore additional service on August 22nd, there will still be 40 muni lines that we will not be bringing back. And we have no financial path for restoring those lines uh, unless we get uh, substantial changes in how we are funded. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and that's it. Uh, happy to take questions. Well, thank you so much. I, I think it's evident from uh, the introductions that you guys have shared that there are several similarities and then some unique challenges to each of your environments. Um, now we're going to get into the moderated discussion portion and we have some questions that are prepared and as time allows, we'll take some questions from the audience through our question and answer pod. So I encourage the audience to continue to add your questions there. But the first question I'm going to pose to all of the panelists and Carolyn, I'll ask you to start. The question is, how have recent events and uncertainty impacted decision about fleet mixes and how to run assets um, either due to supply chain issues or changes in ridership on certain lines, and how are you addressing the shift in your TAM priorities? So we, um, that's a very good question. We have um, really started to look at what ridership that we're going, the well, the service routes that we're going to be bringing back and what is the ridership groups that we're focusing on in terms of continuing to grow. We were in the middle of doing a um, new service concept plan, working with Jarrett Walker and Associates and looking at ridership versus coverage. Um, we, it's interesting, we're bringing back those routes that are really um, on the ridership, that really were heavy on the ridership and we're seeing growth in those route, routes, some of them. I think what we need to do is the coverage routes are not coming back. So the fleet mixtures that we had where we have these over the road coaches, we're now looking at what do we do with those, those buses that we do have if we don't continue to expand. Those are what we're on order, they're coming in, but are we going to be using them for commuter routes? So what kind of, ex what kind of work will we, what kind of service will we provide with those vehicles if we're not running the um, service? It is one of the things we have to start to also realize is we're bringing back 90% of our hours, but we're only at about 82% of our operating budget, which really tells us the, the the service that we're bringing back was the very costly service that we were serving. It was the service that was less used. Um, it was more of the flex route type service, the demand responsive that was a much higher uh, rate. That's, that's about a $42 an hour service um, where we're seeing buses around $8. Um, five to eight dollars an hour. So we're actually starting to focus more on what is the new market that's going to come out of the new norm and that's focusing us on what kind of vehicles are we going to use to serve that. We're seeing bus rapid transit uh, routes um, as a sort of way we're going to go in the future and we're looking at potentially not bringing back our rail um, at the frequencies we used to do because that's a very highly costly route. So what we're really coming back to is a really a heavily a base system that's going to be serving our essential workers and we will be looking at sort of what kind of fleet mixture do we want to have now that I think is going to be um, changed drastically over the next um, five, six years um, is what we will be looking at. Okay. Um, Jeff, would you like to respond to that question? Uh, I mean, I, I covered uh, some of that. I mean, we, we have completely rebuilt our entire transit system. Uh, we have uh, abandoned schedules uh, almost system wide and switched to headway management in order to eliminate bunching. Uh, while we have eliminated uh, 40 of our lines, uh, we're delivering higher frequency and better speed and reliability. Uh, on our core network than ever in our agency's history. Uh, on our core lines like the 14 Mission Corridor, we're operating every two minutes uh, and with almost perfect spacing. 
uh, which is necessary in order to make sure we're not leaving essential workers behind. Uh, every week we reallocate our service hours uh, to serve the people who need it the most um, uh, and make uh, make adjustments to the line. Um, and uh, and again, we are um, we are leading right now with equity because equity is most important in times of service cuts uh, to make sure that we are prioritizing the people with the greatest need rather than prioritizing uh, the people who uh, complain the loudest. Absolutely. Um, Doug, would you like to respond to that question? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I definitely think that the um, that the event is forcing us into places both in our service and our and in our asset planning and capital programming that we uh, I think we were heading there, but maybe not as quickly as as we are now. On the fixture outside, um, what um, uh, what Carolyn mentioned, uh, we're doing on a smaller scale too. We're looking at core services, higher frequency, um, headway management, as Jeff mentioned, and we don't know that our post-COVID service levels will be, and routing and schedules will be the same as they were before. We're squaring that with customers now and doing more public engagement about that. Um, on the paratransit side, it's a small paratransit division, but we already knew that the way that we were providing it is kind of um, ancient and there were better ways to do it. So we're moving in the direction of um, working on uh, mobility as a service or maybe partnering with non-emergency medical networks, things like that. And we're talking in our case, maybe three to 400 trips a day. So not a really uh, large paratransit service. And uh, post COVID, people want to be the, the, the things that we used to pride ourselves on on the fixed route side, uh, high productivity and trips per bus per hour, fare box recovery, those turned out to be an Achilles heel in, in the pandemic. And on the paratransit side, um, the productivity typically measured in trips per bus per hour. You'd be happy if you get to two and a half or three. Now that's a disaster. You don't want that. You, you know, people want to be alone on that. So, and some of the other models that are out there, some of the models for um, microtransit, and, for, and being used by the non-emergency medical networks are probably more applicable now uh, for us than they've been in the past. And that informs the capital program and the fleet. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, Jessica, would you like to, would you like to uh, provide your perspective on this question? I would, yeah, thanks, Mr. Denny. So, in fall of 2019, Metro actually began shifting our services. We launched a program called Metro Reimagined, and that was the culmination of our comprehensive operational analysis on bus. So at that time, we really focused frequency on our high productivity routes that tended to serve more dense markets. Uh, and that was, had a really good result and ridership was actually growing after a nearly five year ridership loss trend. So we had a very strong January and February of 2020, and then COVID happened. At the same time, back in 2019, we were preparing to launch partnerships with transportation network companies like the one that we have now with Lyft, as well as our microtransit program with VIA. And we have been deliberately focusing those services in some of the markets where our service is otherwise less productive. Now it happens that the footprint of demand in the post-COVID environment heavily favors those productive urban routes. Today, we're carrying a little less than 60% of our base ridership on our bus system. And so much of that ridership is on those core routes where we pre-COVID were running service frequency at least 10 minutes uh, throughout most of the day. And so our fleet management plan is still requiring 40 or 60 foot vehicles on those routes. And so we're continuing with that procurement schedule. We've been delayed a little bit in production uh, like most of our peers out there because our, um, our manufacturers have halted their production program. But the shift that we're continuing to push toward is uh, moving toward battery electric buses, which will begin to roll out in 2021 uh, for our larger coaches and then operating smaller vehicles in a totally different service profile in some of those lighter markets. We actually operated our fixed route, some of those light fixed routes with our paratransit service because demand was so diminished, but we had the human resources and we had the vans available to operate that. We still have vans in service and fixed route in some places today. 
And so shifting toward vans or a smaller profile fixed route vehicle is going to be part of our strategy. Uh, but we might be reducing our total fleet size over time. And in fact, we too have scaled back uh, on some of our forthcoming orders to make space for these other types of mobility. Some of it we're going to operate with smaller vehicles and some of it will likely broker with micro transit providers and transportation network companies that are going to be able to fill in those gaps more efficiently. Now we've reduced our light rail service as well. And so moving long term, we're actually about to begin design on our next light rail extension. And so over the course of the next couple of years, we're going to keep monitoring that service level required because it may impact our total fleet size and actually bring us down a little bit in terms of the number new of new light rail vehicles that we would have had to acquire to accommodate that expansion. That's probably about five years out on the horizon. So a lot of change. The future for us really looks like a more exaggerated version of uh, the Metro Reimagine program that we embarked on in 2019. OK, thank you, Jessica. Um, Jenny, I'd like to give you a chance to chime in as well. OK, it sounds like we may have lost audio for Jenny. Um, I will we'll circle back to her, but I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, this time I will start with um, Jeff. Um, how would you say the current environment has highlighted the understanding that assets need people? How has this made you rethink your approach to transit asset management? Uh, it's uh, COVID has highlighted so many underlying issues uh, in our industry, including the fact that um, people work in this industry out of a sense of dedication to service. Um, our workforce has responded amazingly positively, has come together, broken down silos, is creatively reinventing things because we all understand our role in supporting um, San Francisco's economic recovery and in particularly supporting our people who have the fewest options uh, for being able to participate in society, get to work. Um, it's also exposed the fact that our, uh, our people uh, will overwork themselves. Um, I am deeply concerned uh, knowing that this crisis is going to continue for many, many months. I am really concerned about burnout. Um, our folks are working 60, 80, 90 hour weeks every week and not reporting it on their timesheets and doing it out of a sense of dedication. Um, but I need them to be able to sustain this level of effort. So we've been trying to force people to um, to back off a little bit. We're also working really hard to allow people to do the emotional processing that they need. Our workforce is terrified. Uh, we have had 35 COVID positive cases and we watched as New York City transit uh, operators were literally dying. Um, so our people are dealing with a lot of fear um, and uh, and that fear is exposing not only the, the, the direct fear out of COVID, but it's also bringing up deeply emotional issues around racism within our organization, within uh, misogyny in our organization, uh, transphobia and other phobias within our organization, um, all of which are coming out. Um, and so I've been surprised that it's very much a part of my job to hold the emotional anxiety of the entire organization and to let it arise, but then release it. Um, and at the same time to develop programs for making people feel emotionally safe in their workplace. Um, since March, there has not been a week that has gone by in which someone has not cried in my office or on a Zoom call. Um, and uh, and I, I, as a manager, I have to create space to allow that to happen so that we can sustain the level of effort that's necessary and also heal other issues, longstanding issues in the organization um, uh, so that we can come out of this, the other side, a stronger, more resilient organization. Well, thank you, Jeff, for sharing that. And I think we're all kind of stretching our skill sets here. 
Um, it it um, has come to my attention that Jenny was just on mute. She is not having technical difficulties, so I want to turn it to her to give her an opportunity to um, respond to this question about highlighting the understanding that assets need people and how that's made you rethink your approach to asset management. Okay. Well, um, we're not on the same scale as uh, my peers on this call. We're very small. Um, because we're so small, we don't really get the opportunity to plan far into the future. We're grant dependent, uh, funding dependent FTA, and uh, it kind of depends on, you know, what the FTA has in store for us. Uh, we try to make sure that our our transit asset management plan is up to date, and so we've kind of got, um, we don't have any office staff, so it's just me and I keep my hand on the pulse, so to speak, and um, I'm constantly thinking about, you know, our three to five year plan and whereabouts we are on that and projecting it into the future. Um, but uh, right now we took our oldest bus and we, um, it had been replaced through a grant, but it's not as reliable as I'd like it to be. So what we did was you pulled all the seats out for the jump seat and make it into a mobile food shelf for these communities in northern Minnesota. So we're diversifying and uh, we didn't even really know that we were. And so we are kind of got a finger in every pie here, you know, providing services for the communities uh, regardless of what those uh, services are, if transportation can play a part in whatever program is happening in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And I think that this um, national emergency um, it ha affects everyone, uh, large agencies as well as small, and the TAM program can also be scaled for both small and large programs. Um, I'd like to go to Doug now and ask for his insights on the um, current environment and how that's highlighted his agency's understanding about assets needing people and how they've rethought their approach to transit asset management. All right, so um, I think Jeff is exactly right when he says terrifying. Um, this is very frightening, it has been since the beginning, it is today, and I fear even though Connecticut's doing very well right now that um, we'll see more problems down the road. Our experience has been on days where we thought we understood everything and we were ahead of this, uh, within very short notice, it was all around us again. We, Our own experience being near the first epicenter is, and this might not sound big to some and it will sound huge to others, but for an agency our size, we had three drivers and three administrative uh, staff members uh, test positive, some with at various levels of illness, some with no symptoms. And among our paratransit contractor, uh, the virus took hold in the call center very early on, and we had Doug, are you there? Unfortunately, it looks like Doug, uh, we have lost our connection with Doug. Um, we will revisit this question when we're able to secure um, a link with him, but I'm going to go ahead and turn this um, to Jessica Meffer Miller at uh, St. Louis Metro. Would you like to share with us your your perspectives? I would. Thank you. So, you know, if if COVID has taught us one thing about our personnel with respect to operations and capital programs, it is the importance of our team. So here at Bystate Development, which is our uh, parent company, we are over 2,500 team members strong, and every day. I am inspired and I'm humbled by the dedication and the resilience of this team. We have been operating at varying degrees throughout our COVID response. Uh, of those 2,500 team members, we have had a little over 60 positives and we have had two fatalities. And so uh, for our team emotionally, and when you layer on the impact of um, racial inequity and the civil unrest that we've experienced here in the St. Louis region once again. It's a raw time and uh, like 
Jeff mentioned, we're really having to focus on trying to preserve our capacity to continue operations and to sustain and recover beyond COVID. And so that means having conversations about mental wellness and mental health at a much higher degree than we've had in the past. It also means focusing on resting our team members. We have reorganized some of our operation temporarily for COVID response. I talked about that a little bit earlier with respect to our emergency operations program. Now that includes our capital programs and our operating programs. And so we're trying right now uh, through late July and the month of August to uh, strategically rest team members because we're really at what may be the midway point right now. And that's hard to do, but we're literally having to tell people you must take a little bit of time off because we're five months in, we're running hard and fast and it takes a toll and we won't be able to sustain through and beyond this crisis if we do not rest our team and focus our efforts. This also means we have had to have conversations about what we must do now and what we must put off or delay. And that's very hard. I, we have an aggressive three-year capital program. I am committed to delivering that program, but we are having to make some adjustments either because of absenteeism, because our team members and their families are impacted by COVID-19, or because we have to spend the personnel time that we do have on um, re activities related to COVID and operations response outside of our normal program. One thing that we have been focused on for the last couple of years in earnest that we're really um, increasing our focus on is succession planning. We've got a large team uh, like many in the transit industry and industries outside of transit. We have a large number of team members who are near the latter stages of their career and so we're using this experience and the intensity that it brings to create new cross-disciplinary collaboration opportunities and to also task some of our middle and um, you know, mid-high level management team members with a different level of responsibility. And that in part is helping to prepare them for the next generation of leadership here at Bi-State Development. And this includes our uh, capital program teams, including facilities, engineering, and um, vehicle maintenance. It, this has humbled us and it has really taught us if we're gonna be here today, tomorrow, and beyond, we have got to have the team that's equipped to deliver that vision and our capital and operating programs. Thank you, Jessica. It looks like we've been able to reestablish um, the connection with Doug and I wanna invite him to um, finish his answer, Doug. Sure, you can hear me now, okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, sure. Well, I think what I, uh, the heart of it, the heart of the matter is that everything that we have been doing since the start of this, since very early on, January and February has been towards the protection of the, of the staff. And Jeff's right when he says that people are terrified and holding it together uh, has been very difficult. But I think uh, some of the key elements were uh, the quick changes to the cleaning protocol, the quick changes to the service uh, relating to fair collection, suspension of fair collection and that and that type of thing, rear door entry, and also a lot in service planning. I, I didn't mention earlier what we did, but in service planning, we, we didn't necessarily cut back. We didn't really cut back on the hours, but we did cut back routes and we took a look at the ridership uh, after the maybe three weeks in, a month in, and we took service hours away from places where there's little or no ridership and we put those drivers onto a big extra board and assigned them to places downtown and deployed them uh, based on rider report driver reports to us on on uh, crowding which instead of 30 or 40 or 50 is now 10 and so we deployed it and i think that's going to be a part of our service planning in the future we may uh, increase the extra board not to adjust for the absenteeism associated with um with the um, the normal absenteeism, with normal paid time off, but but in order to have a pool of people that we can use, as Jeff managed uh, me message um, mentioned earlier, that we can use for headway management and and crowding. I mean, that's absent new resources for operating that allow us to put more frequent services in place to begin with. Thank you, Doug. Um, Carolyn, I'm coming to you next, but I'm actually going to give you a combo question. So you can either answer the question that the rest of the panel answered, or you can share with us 
what lessons you've learned from this that you will continue after this uh, national emergency is over. OK, so I appreciate <laughs> that second question as well. I think it's a sort of a, a combination. Um, I was fairly new to UTA as the executive director when this came on board. I know Jeff might have been as well with San Francisco, um, but I it was really key to me to understand the system and by and really, really looking at the service that we were putting out there. The whole it feels like the whole world has changed very quickly and actually it felt like it changed very quickly within it felt like a few a month and it really was within 10 days to two weeks how fast we made changes and um, pull back our service. Uh, the one thing I want to do is just really congratulate my workforce and just how um, durable and flexible they are. Now I will say Utah was not hit very hard around the first run when the East Coast and the West Coast was sort of being hit um, fa fairly difficult. We more trended like California was trending at the time and lately we've been seeing a lot of spikes. Our first six months were, I mean our first six weeks, six weeks to two months, we only had three cases out of 2600 um, people in our workforce. Um, the next um, six weeks to two months, now two months, we now have 44 cases and that was just a week ago. I don't know how many more. So we're, we saw it start to spike up substantially as the state decided to reopen. And so trying to keep our workers safe. I think the one thing we realized was is how important our services are to a key group of workers and, uh, and others who need transit. I mean, people didn't quit riding. Um, and that was one of the things that we had a state legislator who was pushing us to saying, why are you still running service? It's, you know, it's one of the things where people can get, be, you know, get uh, COVID-19. And we were like, we were no, no, we are an essential um, service out there out on the streets. And when you look at it, how many people, we still carry 30 some thousand trips at the height of when everything was shut down. People needed to get to work. They needed a flexible schedule. They needed us to provide those trips and they needed also the ability to get to their grocers and to um, stores that they needed to get to, to appointments they needed to get to. That was so important. And so the idea of being able to continue to do that was important to us. So we know we always have to be providing that service. And sometimes I think we, we think too hard about the market we're trying to grab and the commuters that we're trying, you know, in the commuter market, we're working very hard and it's 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 um, it's very uh, welcoming to see a market that's really behind you. And when we did our rider survey, how happy they were that we were still providing the service, how good our communication was to them about what we were doing on the on on the safety needs. Now, we didn't go to a mask wearing until July 1st that everybody had to wear a mask, including our operators and others. And that was only um, a lot had to do with the governor not having a mask mandate for the state and that only certain counties were finally able to put a mask mandate into place. And so then we put it across the whole system into counties that don't have a mask mandate. We have not had pushback. So I think the thing that we're trying to work for is making sure we in the future, everything now is about building confidence in our riders to come back. And so we didn't lay off any operators. We just changed their shifts. Most of them working three hour, three day work weeks, two two days off, but on a rec, um, uh, but on an on call basis. Like they would be called in if they needed to be on, sort of like an extra board, but not quite. But that's the way we ran it. But our maintenance workers have taken on new duties. They're maintaining it. We're looking at how our buses are being used. This plays into the asset management. How are we going? You know, they they really took heart everything that they could do because they still had jobs. And so they put lists up and I, vi I visited all the business units during this time frame, all the shifts late at night and everything and went in and saw their list that they put together, things they can now get done and they're just ticking them off um, because not all the vehicles are going out on the street. Now in a few months, in a month, we will have them all, almost all of them back out. But if they aren't, not if some of them are not being used, does it stretch our useful life out? I think this is something FDA is going to think about in the future. It's not the useful life of a vehicle if you're not using it as much or, or you're able to stretch it over time if you didn't use all your vehicles is something that we'll probably be talking to FTA about as well. We won't be on the normal maybe 
asset management replacement plan that we thought we would be. So there's all those things that we're starting to consider. So, um, but I do have to say that I think the lessons learned is, is there is a real essential group of people that we have to continue to focus on serving and serving well and serving better that we did in the future. And it has a lot to do with the equity issues and the service that we're putting in when we're going into Title VI and we, we're not quite doing Title VI, but even when we're having those reviews that FTA has requ just requested, we're putting more service in those areas than we had before. And um, I'm appreciative of this sort of step back and relook at our service and what we're doing and what we're putting out on the street. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I'm going to ask this question of the rest of the panel. Um, and if we have time left, then we'll get to some of the questions from the participants. But the question that I um, posed to Carolyn, what lessons have you learned from this that you will continue after the national um, emergency is over? Um, I will go to uh, Jenny next. Hi. Um, lessons learned. Uh, I think this is going to be our new our new uh, way of operating in the future. I'm looking at doing more um, non-emergency medical rides and volunteer drivers, uh, smaller vehicles, smaller number of people on the bus, um, the cleanliness, the virus mitigation. Uh, I think we're going to be leaving all of that in place uh, for the future. Um, it's just uh, we're looking at more individualized services and uh, and workers and commuter routes. And uh, as far as transit asset management, uh, we're looking at, you know, the mileage on the vehicles isn't going to be so high. Uh, we're not going to age out a vehicle as quickly, I don't think, because um, at one time we were putting probably 120,000 miles on every 10 months. And so I think that's going to be um, we put it out over a period of uh, or spread it out over a number of vehicles. Um, but I think this is kind of our new direction for Big Woods Transit as far as more individualized services. So, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, same question for uh, Jessica. Sure, thank you. So I think I talked a little bit earlier about our service profile and some of the lasting differences that I think that we'll have moving forward. I think this also changes a little bit our understanding of uh, performance and how we measure performance. Historically, it's been cost effectiveness and productivity, and we've had to throw some of those out the window, including the way we roster runs on our bus service. For example, we used to have uh, many of our runs were splits. Operators had very long work days. At this moment in time, we're working our operators with an eight hour guarantee. They're all on straight runs uh, so that they can minimize their duration of exposure and minimize the number of team members that we actually have at our divisions waiting in ready rooms between shifts. We're also focused more um, on connecting the operator shift or schedule and our vehicle maintenance and cleaning program. Some of that I think we're going to take with us. Uh, beyond all of this, you know, I think one of on a, on a high note, one of my favorite uh, pieces of our COVID-19 response that we are going to take forward with us is our ability to be nimble, to make decisions quickly, to turn some of our operating and capital programs on a dime. Now, the pace, of course, has to let up at some point uh, in the future. But we've been able to implement a number of different service changes very quickly. We have changed our capital programs to focus on uh, readiness and COVID mitigation strategies very quickly. And that's taken a lot of the ingenuity of the team. One of the things that we've learned from is really pulling from the team members from the front line on up for solutions on how we can do a better job, whether that's mitigating COVID risk or becoming efficient, connecting our operators, uh, more into the scheduling process because they have been willing to be more vocal. I want to take that with us as a transit entity within our region. We've also made some bold decisions in the last several months. We are here in the Midwest where we tend to be a bit conservative and cautious. And 
uh, our governmental partners weren't doing things like implementing mask requirements. Uh, some of our stay at home orders in different jurisdictions that we served were a bit lax. So we early on began communicating that transit was to be used for essential trips only. We had our operators begin wearing masks as a requirement back in April, and we began requiring our customers to wear masks on May 11th. Now we have since had mask orders implemented across the jurisdictions that we serve, but those came much later. And so I think that there is a boldness um, that we have recognized and a momentum that I hope that we can carry forward after the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, and I'll tell you as a region here in St. Louis, I think we have all learned the essential nature of transit, how critical the service that we provide is. We're still carrying uh, most of our bus uh, customers, and I think that really demonstrates why we do what we do. And we, we fielded and still field questions from people who are saying, we're in the midst of a pandemic, why are you operating? And even from our union and our workforce, we've had this tough conversation because we're operating because we're carrying these essential workers uh, to their destinations and we are keeping the St. Louis region moving. And so I'm hopeful that beyond this, that's going to uh, strengthen support and recognition of the importance of transit in our region. Thank you. Well said. Um, Doug, would you like to um, give us your uh, lessons learned that you plan to continue after? Sure, I hope you can hear me all right with this. Um, I agree with everything that's been said so far, and there are, in my view, technical lessons that we learned. Uh, for example, uh, our cleaning program was a hardy cleaning program, but wasn't really considered an environmental services division like you'd see in a hospital or even a university or something like that. So we're taking a look at that, dismantling what we've been doing and rebuilding it as its own piece, not a subset of a relatively small maintenance department. Um, we definitely adopted new ways to communicate both internally and externally, right? So um, we ha we've had more than I think 15 external newsletters and, and social media campaigns since it started and some 25 internally to keep people posted and that's been key to this. There's no reason to stop that. Um, definitely new types of service planning focusing on higher frequency, uh, crowd management, uh, reliability, legibility, leaving some of the more lackluster services to other other modes and other methods. And and certainly, and we haven't talked much about it today, uh, fare structure and fare collection. For us, that's uh, something that we're looking at very difficult. But for me, I think the biggest takeaway personally is I'm done with apologetic planning for the importance of transit. This has demonstrated, right? We, you know, we spend so much time talking about how transit reduces congestion, you know, uh, you know, by 1.6% or some number like that, that's important. And that's what we use as a selling point traditionally. Also, we talk about transit in the environment. We all know it, we use that to sell it. But going forward in my advocacy and my request for investment in operations, I'm gonna be talking about these folks who have been going and haven't stopped the whole time and how they're kind of a, a new essential employee that most didn't envision before the people stocking the shelves, working at hospital services and things like that. So that's 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 the advocacy that we're, that's the and that's the approach that, that I'm taking with me. And I think many people on, on, on my staff here are, are also considering. I mean, it's just, it's just it, we, we all knew in the industry it was essential, it's essential. Uh, now everyone knows it's essential and there's no reason to have to explain it any other way, except we kept going, the services kept running, Oh no, we lost Doug again. Um, he was just getting on a roll. I really love that term that he used, unapologetic planning. I'm sure I'm going to hear it again in some future uh, presentations. Um, hopefully we'll get him back to finish his thoughts, but um, I'd like to get uh, Jeff to uh, answer that question. Again, last, but again, not mm -hmm. least, um, to share with us what uh, you guys are going to take with you after this is over. So I think the my other panelists have already covered most of the key points. We have learned many of the same lessons at SFMTA, um, particularly, uh, you know, I mean, Winston Churchill and later Rahm Emanuel famously said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, a crisis is always going to expose all underlying weaknesses within your organization. 
and force you to make the hard calls your agency has been avoiding making for many years. And that has absolutely uh, been the case of the SFMTA. We've done probably 10 years worth of work uh, in three months because we've had no other choice. Uh, and we've been able to, to succeed in getting that work done um, in part because we have led with equity, doing actual quantitative equity analytics uh, and making the trade-offs clear and transparent and rooted in the experience of people uh, is a really effective way of doing uh, rapid change in a tough time. Um, we've also, because of the pace at which we are working, uh, we need to, uh, we've, we've had to train all of our staff how to deal with risk um, and particularly failure. Uh, we're operating at a ridiculously fast pace, uh, and that means uh, things get screwed up along the way. Um, so rather than hiding those mistakes, uh, we're trying to get people to talk about their mistakes and to train their colleagues on how to uh, avoid uh, those mistakes and instead learn from them. We've also been very forward with the press and with our policymakers. Every time we get something wrong, uh, that we go and correct it rather than trying to hide the problem. Um, it's also meant that we've had to completely rethink engagement uh, here in San Francisco. You know, moving a bus stop can take two years and be incredibly contentious. Um, so rather than doing long, arduous planning processes and, you know, pointless environmental analysis, uh, we've had to instead do a lot of piloting and do temporary emergency measures and do the engagement not in advance of the project, but as a component of implementing the project. So we're going out and trying things and then talking to our passengers, talking to people on the street, talking to the business community, talking to the disabled rights advocates uh, and making adjustments in real time based upon that actual direct engagement from real experience, rather than spending a lot of time listening to professional meeting attenders um, about their fears. Um, and finally, I think another key lesson uh, that we've learned is about needing to um, get outside of our silo. Um, so we've been forcing a lot of collaboration across silos within the agency, but particularly partnering with other public agencies, nonprofit organizations, business associations, and so on. Um, continually asking what transit is for, why do we exist? We have to understand the why in order to figure out how best to allocate our limited service hours and limited staff capacity. Oh, and finally, one more thing that is also critical is complete and utter transparency. We're putting all of our budget numbers, our expenditures, our revenue up on our COVID dashboard. We've been publicly transparent about our COVID positive cases. We're basically trying to take all the information that we've got and make it publicly available so that everyone can understand why we are making the very, very tough calls that we're making and why we're making adjustments based upon the ever changing data. Thank you so much. Um, I see that we had Doug back. I wanted to give him an opportunity um, to finish his statement, but I also want to um, ask at least well, I want to point out if you are a uh, clock watcher that we are exactly one minute away from the next item on our agenda, but I did want to get to at least one question. Um, it's not often that we have this kind of a panel in front of us. Um, so uh, Doug, you can finish your statement, but I also like to introduce this question to you. Ha um, has reduced bus capacity impacted social distancing on any of your routes? I, I know you touched on it briefly before, but if you could expand on it. Sure. Um, just to finish up what I was saying before about the unapologetic planning, uh, I just think it's it's widely understood now or an, uh, maybe even an easier case to make at least here in Connecticut to the General Assembly and the funding uh, sources um, of the importance of bus transit. It's half of all public transportation in Connecticut, the other half being rail, and it, it's it, I think it's demonstrated its importance. On the specific question about reduced capacity, um, in our case, uh, no, because the because the service design, our first COVID modification one, uh, was designed to um, take service hours away from places where um, where it wasn't being used and put that in places where we would have crowding, meaning something more than ten or fifteen people. 
the real problem going forward, and here's the conundrum, there's really no getting around it, is everyone wants ridership to come back, but is the capacity there for ridership to come back um, and still maintain social distancing? That's a problem. And so I find myself, and I suspect other transit agencies, thinking on a longer scale as to when ridership comes back, focusing on high frequency, and then seeing what science brings us about vaccines and other methods of protecting the riders and drivers. So it hasn't been so much in our case, the reduction of service because we really didn't do that much. It's going to be the return of riders where buses were, you know, back in before this, very busy, you know, standing room only. We have signs on our illuminators that say a bus full, you know, take the next one, sadly. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Jessica, you talked a little bit about some of the changes in your service um, that you have planned or that you have done. Would you like to respond to this question about um, reduced bus capacity impacting social distancing on your routes? Yeah, so our service reduction strategy has been driven largely by our available operators. So we can only put out the service level that we can reasonably sustain. And so we have focused much of the service that we are operating on those busy routes where demand is still high. Now, uh, system wide, we are a little, as I mentioned, under 60% of our normal capacity, but we have routes that are still carrying the majority of their pre COVID loads. And so that's where we have focused our intensive resources. And we have had to hold back on restoring some of the routes that are still suspended today so that we can target our efforts and our vehicles on those busy routes. Now for us, that means we have had instances, unfortunately, where we've got a standing load. So we're now carrying not more than a full seated load and we're typically not getting to that and that's on those busy routes. We are operating with a very heavy extra board at all of our bus divisions and we're using that board in part to target uh, those busy trips and sliding in trips between them. And so this is teaching us um, a lot more dynamic dispatching than we're accustomed to. There's a cost to that. It, it becomes difficult to sustain um, that dynamic dispatching. And for us, headway based management, which is not something that we have long been accustomed here at Metro, uh, but it's really focusing us to, to target those resources and question whether or not we need to restore some of our routes or whether there might be a fixed route replacement so that we can support the capacity that's needed uh, on some of our core routes. We're also, it's requiring a lot of feedback from our frontline team uh, back to planning. This is part of our daily conversations about what we can do and we're learning just how nimble we can be. So I, I think that is a real plus, but uh, moving forward, fielding the needed capacity is gonna continue to be a challenge for us because of course, financially uh, our personnel and our vehicle resources aren't growing. If anything, they would shrink over time and yet um, we're having to limit capacity. So a standing load on a daily basis on our busy routes uh, used to be kind of a target, right? And now we have to run from that. So again, it's changing how we understand performance and productivity and what our goal is. Thank, awesome, thank you. Um, I want to go to Jenny next because I know that there are some issues that your agency are dealing with in terms of uh, the number of rides per week and volunteer drivers and how that um, your bus capacity is impacting or is impacted, <clears throat> excuse me, by the social distancing. All right, thank you. Um, uh, well, we started out by, um, I had a grant, our, com our um, commuter bus was really taking off and we we're finding that uh, the buses uh, were at certain days of the week were at capacity and uh, there's no, we don't really do the standing part like you would in one of the urban centers because it's an hour on the bus to get to work and because uh, it's 65 miles one way. And so uh, we were going to order the larger buses. Well, we found out that, you know, that's not going to meet our needs, uh, not only with the but driver shortages that we're seeing, but also with the social distancing. And so we've uh, continued to order the smaller buses 
and then we can send two buses depending on how many people are signed up for those uh, routes and um, we control the social distancing that way. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, would you like to respond to this question? Sure, as um, part of the recovery task force that I put together early on in April, um, knowing that we would have to start looking at a recovery plan, um, there is a woman on there who is was um, from our, well, actually she runs our business intelligence group, which is just primarily her <laughs> with help from others from the agency. But what she has done is, is we, are, we monitor every day do, through our automatic passenger counters by hour of the day on every route, we know how many people are on. We get that information the next day. And if we see a pattern, part of our guidelines was is that if we saw over 10 in the high risk phase on a bus, we would put out, we, like over a period of time, if we're monitoring and seeing it consistently over a few days, we would put another bus out there to keep the social distancing. In the moderate, in the moderate phase, which we're doing now, it's 20. In the low risk phase, it's 30 on the buses, and it and it's scaled differently for the rail vehicles. And then, um, in the new norm, we're hoping that it'll we'll be able to hair, carry a capacity load. But right now, that's what we were doing. So we monitor it, and in some routes, we've actually added service or more frequency to handle where we're hitting those guidelines. Particularly 20, we're trying to keep 20 passengers in the moderate risk areas, which is in Salt Lake County. And so we've done, that's one of the ways. And so we monitor every day. And if we start to see 20 consistently, like 30 people on a bus where we thought it would be 20, we will move, we'll make those changes. So that's one of the ways we've been monitoring um, the capacity on these routes. It will change once we start running more service, we will have less availability of vehicles. Um, but right now we have a lot of extra vehicles that we could end up modifying the service. So that is sort of the, I think the technical way we're doing things and reviewing things. Um, and then we've also gone in and um, uh, tried to uh, also take a look at some of those routes that run um, in areas where we see higher usage during certain times. And those are areas we did have a, a homeless shelter that had um, 98 out of the 205 residents test positive for COVID. And they were, and that that was one of our major routes, and we had a lot of people traveling there. We can't, we're not going to stop service. We did um, uh, the, the the the, and it's a shelter where all the services are included. It was a new a new program that they have implemented over the last two years. So it was a men's shelter that included all the services that they would need on site. But many of them still go out, and some of them have jobs. They live there, and they can go. They do have jobs, so we still needed to get them places. Anybody who did test positive with COVID were moved to another area where they had, were, were, were help, um, uh, taking care of them, but we still didn't know in that monitoring. It, it did make our operators quite uncomfortable. It was like announced on the news and it became a big, you know, an issue. Um, I think we, but we didn't quit servicing the area. We just try to provide more social distancing. We put more buses on the route. So it's the ability to be nimble and be flexible. And I will say that, um, that you know the the operators have been great in being able to manage that, and that's something that we'll continue to take a look at. Thank you, and Jeff, I promise I'm not coming to you last on purpose every time. It just so happened to work out that way again. <laughs> um, would you like to uh, respond to this question? Um, and this is going to be the last question that we have time for today. Um, any other questions we didn't get to, we will. Um, uh, take back and we will respond. Jeff. Uh, sure, the the uh, the health and financial disasters um, have resulted in, in a 30% loss of service hours uh, at Muni and then social distancing eliminates two thirds of, of our capacity on our remaining service. So, so altogether we have lost 70 to 80% of our capacity. Um, this is obviously really bad and it's causing us to leave a essential workers behind at the curb every single day. Unfortunately, we've got really good automated passenger counters on all of our vehicles and we can track uh, standing load in real time and make adjustments. Uh, we're also using that data to reallocate our services, our service hours to minimize uh, the uh, uh, leaving essential workers behind. Um, I would also like 
point to point world uh, that is asking for six feet of social distance on public transit. Uh, and uh, and I think the CDC's approach in regulating mobility for COVID is a perfect example of structural racism at work, particularly when you compare the CDC's effort at uh, managing the airlines where there's no social distance requirement and where they delegate it to industry. Uh, the management approach for minimizing COVID transmission on airplanes, uh, as opposed to actually using science, uh, as we are trying to do at SFMTA, uh, doing our own uh, experiments to measure uh, air turnover, as well as doing contact tracing to demonstrate, uh, as has happened in every country around the world, that public transit is one of the least likely places for you to get uh, 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 to acquire COVID. Um, and uh, from a risk management and value perspective, public transit is uh, a, an essential investment um, that we need to make sure not only keeps running, but maintains sufficient capacity so that our essential workers can actually get to work and that our cities don't choke in traffic congestion, uh, limiting their ability to recover economically. Jeff, thank you so much. In fact, thank you all uh, panelists today. We uh, very much so appreciate your time, um, sharing your experiences with us and your path forward. Um, so thank you. Thank you. So thank you. now, oh, sorry. Now we're going to turn to the next item on our agenda, um, and that is the FTA TAM program update with Roxanne Ledesma, who is the acting TAM program manager at FTA. Roxanne. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Roxanne Ledesma. And as Ms. Shadoni said, I'm the Acting Town Program Manager. And Ms. Shadoni and myself will, will be talking to you about the TAM program updates. Next slide. Today we're going to talk about the program update, the program highlights, TAM today, and technical assistance. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Let's go over the TAM program highlights first. So here are some highlights from last year. We published the NTD fact sheets, and this is summarizing the data that the transit agencies reported to NTD, and it provides an inventory and assessment of the condition of assets used to provide transit service nationally. We had two TAM round tables the multimodal and the bus operator. The multimodal was in Baltimore and it was for larger and more complex bus operators. And the bus operator one was in St. Louis, which was an event designed for smaller tier one and tier two agencies. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben, could you go back please? We also had, we also started a TAM program evaluation. This is the first set of interviews and a focus group where we were continue, we're gonna be continuing this for the next three years. The TAM program evaluation is a multi-year assessment of the effectiveness of TAM and of FTA's development on the TAM program and implementation of the final rule. Another highlight, we updated the TAM webpage. You'll see this later on in the slideshow and We've published events on the web page, roundtable, the webinar, and some peer exchanges. And we posted the asset management guide supplement. This report provides detailed information about asset category organization and current life cycle management practices. Next slide. We have some products that are currently in the works. You should be expecting to see this soon. We have the TAM plan self-assessment. This tool is to help an agency self-assess their TAM program and identify areas of growth, opportunity, and quality. We did a research on system asset category. It was on identifying asset systems. And we had a research synthesis where we have the decision support tool. This gathers existing information and its combined resources it's a process to help make decisions. 
The report will cover existing documentation about decision support tools, including detailed information on procurement and the use of free tools available through FTA. And the investment prioritization report is a process of prioritizing assets, what information is needed and what the results are. This documents the state of practice of how transit agencies prioritize transit investments, and it addresses inherent differences in decision making and agencies of different sizes and resources that affect the prioritization of transit investments. Next slide. Okay, we're going to discuss TAM today. Next slide. So what's next when we go from this? Next slide. To this. Next slide. We need to update our business case. We need to ask ourselves, what about our targets, our priorities, our predictions? This is the time to review and make those changes. Next slide. Your TAM culture can help you. You can be a TAM ambassador and encourage others to become one as well. A TAM culture institutionalizes asset management principles and adheres to them in the agency's everyday practice. Next slide. TAM can help. And as some transit agencies have mentioned, there have been opportunities to rethink on priorities and how things have been done, catch up on deferred maintenance and lower costs through better life cycle and asset management. Next slide. So what can TAM do for you? It can increase return on investments, improve reliability and reduce your safety risk, better evaluate and manage those risks, and provide quantitative data to tell your story. Next slide. And we can help with our TAM technical assistance. Next slide. Our key technical assistance products are our training courses, our webinar series, our online resources, and future resources. Next slide. Here are our training courses. The first course is an introductory course to TAM and is specifically for tier one providers. The second course is for smaller providers and group plan sponsors. Currently due to COVID, there's no offering on these first two courses. But the TSI course is available, the third bullet. TSI is offering a course on calculating performance measures and setting targets. In this course, you will learn how to measure the performance of your agency's transit assets and how to use those performance measures to set effective and achievable targets. This course is online and self-paced. And we're excited to announce that we've been working on a new course. It's called the Enhancing Your TAM Program Lifecycle with Lifecycle Management. This course discusses managing asset life cycles and risk. We're still working on this course, but we're trying to offer this course online four times a year. So it's a virtual course. And we just held the pilot um, the week of July 6th. Next slide. These are all the webinars that we held since the last TAM roundtable. A lot of these web webinars are either solely by FTA or they were done as part of a collaboration. So we had the Enga Engaging Your TAM Stakeholders, which was done with APTA, in-house tools to support TAM, baseline TAM data in NTD, this was a video, improving your asset information and embracing continuing improvement, also done with APTA, Workforce Planning and Development, Multi-State Transit Technical Assistance Program, and Using NTD Data to Support TAM. Next slide. Here's the template. This was highlighted in last year's roundtable, and we wanted to let you know that this is currently available. This is moving away from the Excel workbook to an online tool. We call it the template. And it's replacing the small provider template that was previously provided. But the small provider template is still available online as well. And this is specifically helpful for group TAM plan sponsors, developing plans for their subs, 
or tier two transit providers developing their own individual plans. Next slide. Here's our website. So our website is full of resources. And if you look on the left hand side of this slide, you can see um, our menu. Next slide. And if you click on resource search, next slide. You get to this table. This is an interactive table and all of our all of our resources and tools are published here. You can look for things by keyword and the author would be basically the the author would be basically the agency's name, either either FTA, APTA, or a transit agency. And you can search by dates, document type, that would mean either webinar, a report, a newsletter, or by tag. So we encourage you to submit examples of policies, processes, tools, or any other resources, and FTA can include it in this table. Next slide. Okay, some of our future resources. These are things we're looking into and working on. We're looking into resources for smaller agencies and we're looking into the TAM Professional Capacity Building Program. This is a new approach to be more cohesive in our technical assistance in the development and the dissemination. We want to focus on building capacity at the agencies. This will establish a structured and institutionalized framework to, for FTA to provide ongoing and increasingly mature technical assistance and identify opportunities for workforce development and staff development and encourage ongoing research. We're talking about a new class, a TAM bootcamp style course. This would be a, a new course in a bootcamp style. And we also have the advanced TAM review. This could be a possible oversight tool which could help identify areas in the TAM program that are in risk and offer resources, technical assistance, and follow-up actions. Next slide. I also wanted to remind you about research. There's many different avenues and programs out there for research, and these are just some of them. You have TRB's Transit Cooperative Research Program. And this serves as one of the means by which the public transportation industry can develop innovative near-term solutions to meet demands placed on it. We have ASTRO's Special Committee on Research and Innovation, and its mission is to support ASTRO and the transportation community by delivering strategic, high-quality research results while addressing development technology transfer and implementation. And APTA's Research and Technology Committee which provides guidance and direction to the work of advancing technology and innovative systems for public transportation. Next slide. So like I said before, there's many programs for research and I just wanted to highlight one program in particular, but there's many of them. This is FTA section 5312 Public Transportation Innovation Discretionary Grant Program. Research on asset maintenance and repair systems, new developments in asset management are all ideas that your agency could potentially apply for discretionary funding if found eligible. Next slide. And our best technical assistance is right here, our TAM Regional Points of Contacts. Each region has between one to two TAM regional point of contacts, and they're here to help you get the mission done. So we wanna thank them. And I wanna also take this opportunity to thank the TAM roundtable team, Ms. Shadoni Smith from FTA, Ada Beton and Benjamin Brissett from the USDOT Volpe Center. Next slide. So this concludes the TAM program presentation. If you have any training needs, resource needs, ideas, any feedback, you can email us at tam at dot.gov. Thank you. All right, now, All right, now we're going to take um, a few questions. Um, Roxanne, there's one in the um, Q&A that asks, what is the expected release date 
of the research synthesis on decision support and investment prioritization. I'll go ahead and chime in on that one. Um, we are in the final review stages and we anticipate that those uh, synthesis documents will be available uh, sometime early fall on our uh, TAM webpage. So taking a look into the question and answer pod, um, a couple questions have already been answered, but I'll go ahead and ask them again. Uh, what is the best way to contact your regional contact? Roxanne? So if you don't have the emails for your regional contacts, we, we should be able to provide those, but you can also contact us at tam at dot.gov and direct you to your regional contact if you don't have the contact um, immediately. But we can also share those contacts. OK, thank you. And I just wanted to um, respond that or uh, mention that ASHDO's Special Committee on Research and Innovation recommends research for NCHRP funding, which also includes transit related re research. Thank you for adding that um, uh, extra clarity for us in terms of uh, the type of fu uh, research funding that ASHDO provides. So I don't see any additional questions coming in right now. So with that, I'm going to uh, mention that, or I want to thank Roxanne uh, for your presentation and also let you know that this is not your last opportunity to ask questions of FTA. Um, that web page and the email address that's up on your screen right now are the best way to contact us. Um, the email is always um, manned or womaned, however you want to um, describe it. Um, and we will get back to you as soon as possible um, once we get information there. And we're also pasting an evaluation of today's event in your question and answer pod now. You'll also receive it uh, via email for those of you that have registered for um, today's event. And if you'll just take a few minutes to fill it out, we'll appreciate the feedback since this is indeed our very first virtual um, roundtable. It would be very helpful for us. Oh, it looks like some questions came in while I was closing. <laughs> so great. Um, let's see what we can, those questions are. Um, so we have a couple of questions. I'm going to publish all of the questions even if I can't actually answer them. So let's just have a look see. The, okay, um, one of the moderators did uh, publish the evaluation tool. Um, Lou Cripps asked, when is that system guidance guidebook expected? Um, we are in the process of finalizing uh, that guidebook and we hope to have that published also in the fall. Um, on the FTA side of things, the priorities definitely have shifted given all of you know the, the national pandemic that's happened. They've shifted on our side as well and uh, producing some of the documentation has been a little bit slowed, but our expectation is sometime this fall. Thank you for asking. Um, there is another question in the pod about when is the 2020 entity policy manual? See another document um, going to be posted. There were many changes last year. 25% of our time for preparing reports is behind us now. Martin, I understand and I uh, 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 respect your question and in fact we are very close to publishing the 2020 policy manuals um, with specific guidance. In fact, I believe there is a COVID related reporting addendum that is already published on the entity webpage. Um, we are also planning um, NTI courses and webinars to get 
the um, reporters, the entity reporters up to speed. Um, many of you are aware that we have extended or we did extend the 2019 reporting period for NTD for those affected um, by the national pandemic to allow more time for reporting um, into the NTD. So we are actually just closing the 2019 year. So we're a little bit behind and, and I that's definitely a respectable um, identification there, but we are moving forward. Um, Anonymous asked the question about the process of submitting a proposal for the research 5312 funding. Roxanne, did you want to take that one? Sure. So 5312, since it's a discretionary program, this it gets announced once a year and you need to keep an eye out for the notice of funding opportunity that comes out that FTA publishes. You need to keep an eye out for those alerts. It actually closed for this year, probably around a month ago. It's posted on our website, but I did want to make mention of it because it happens before our round table. That way you can track it um, next year during the beginning of the year. Thanks, Roxanne. Yes, one of um, kind of the missions of the TAM team is we just want to make sure that we keep our asset management community aware of opportunities um, to grow and to mature in asset management, as well as um, informed about FTA policies and practices. So this is just kind of like information for you for the future. Um, so you have on your screen the post event evaluation QR form as well as the URL. And I believe that those were all of the questions that we received in the chat pod. Again, I want to thank everyone for their rapt attention today, and I'd like to turn um, the uh, the event over to John Georges for some closing remarks. Or maybe not. Um, seems as if we're kind of plagued with some Bill, technical. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Okay. Thanks, Fish. <laughs> sorry, that I want to thank the uh, more than 300 of you who turned out uh, for today's session. Uh, I think the strong trend, uh, which we're really happy with, really speaks to um, how transit asset management remains relevant um, despite um, everything that's going on. We definitely heard today how so much has changed and really how much has changed so quickly. Um, we heard about all the practices taken to uh, do enhanced cleaning of our transit systems, the challenges of dealing with rising absenteeism as uh, our, you know, the need to have enough staff between um, their own health concerns and taking care of their children and their uh, elderly that they're living with to continue to put service out in the road. We heard about new maintenance protocols and new ways of staffing maintenance and capital construction activities and developing new service patterns um, to handle the challenges. And then uh, we also heard about the new funding challenges that um, are sticking with us. Above all, we heard that although so much has changed, that this is definitely not the new normal. Um, and but this will not be but nor will things be going back to the way that they were before. Uh, some of these challenges are going to stick with us and it will be a long time um, you know, before ever, uh, things are back to the way they were before, if they ever are. Uh, transit's facing a number of vital questions as we go forward. How do we prioritize scarce available funding? Uh, what new vehicles will we need in an age of social distancing? How do we engage in succession planning for the future? And above all, what sort of risk planning do we need to do for the next unexpected event um, after this one? Uh, transit asset management may not have all the answers to this, uh, but I think we heard that engaging in the asset management planning process can be a guidepost as we work with our teams um, to answer these sorts of questions. So I'd like to once again uh, thank our panelists, uh, Jessica Mefford Miller, Jeff Tumlin, Jenny Rowland, Doug Hol Holcomb, and Carolyn Ganome. On behalf of the panel, as well as the Department of Transportation staff, including Bob Tusillo, our Associate Administrator, Michidoni Smith and Roxanne Ledesma, as well as Anne Baton and Benjamin Brissett and <coughs> uh, Rendell, who have been working behind the scenes. Thank you all very much for attending uh, today, uh, and we hope that you will join us for a future roundtable in the future. Thank you.